Hey everybody, welcome back to the Tipsy Ghost. We're your tipsy hosts, Sarah, Sarah, and Lindsay. Hey guys. Hi. Hey. All right, I want to know, if you were to change your career entirely, what would you pick? Okay, give me a minute. (laughs) I would love to do autopsies. Really? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Somehow I'm not surprised by that at all. With half the things behind us, I don't know how anybody could be surprised. Mm-hmm. Peaceful patients. <laughs> Peaceful. Pa- yes. Mm-hmm. Not a lot of conversations. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't like talking to people. Not a lot of conversations. <laughs> don't have a lot of conversations. <laughs> it's perfect for me. <laughs> Although I could see if you were doing autopsies, you'd pull out your recorder, you'd place it on their chest, and you'd be like, hello, is anyone in here with me right now? I would love to do that with you uh bob smith (laughs) bob are you here what was your favorite memory do you have a message for your wife psychic mortician oh i changed my career (laughs) i would like to be not somebody that does autopsies because you have to go to court oh you want to involve them somewhere in yeah in like the funeral setting but where i don't have to talk to family I think morticians do talk to family. Okay, um, can I just embalm? Sure. I need one of you two to be the face I'll of the run funeral, the funeral home. home. <laughs> we'll run the funeral you home. Do that. Oh, of it. yes. You run all the. <laughs> okay, Lindsay, you're the face of the funeral home. You do the makeup. I embalm. Okay, because I, would like I that. can sit there and hold their hands and. Yep. Oh, I don't want to. They're do that. there. <laughs> no, no not for me. That's my what I do now. <laughs> I answered for all three of you. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, so now I'll run our social media. <laughs> We're a real lively crew. <laughs> <laughs> the real lively funeral home. Man, we've been dead lately. We need to get some patience in here. We really need to liven this place up. <laughs> Too far. Sarah, what would be your other career besides the funeral home? <laughs> That's been decided for you. Um, can it be anything? And I don't, it doesn't matter how talented or untalented I am. Yes, it could be anything. Let's say money's not an object. I would love to be a dancer for Taylor Swift. <laughs> okay. Backup dancer for Taylor Swift. <laughs> you changing your career? <laughs> you want to be a backup dancer for Taylor Swift? I would like to be the one who watches her cats. Oh, and that sounds okay. really fun. Yeah. I was like, you being on stage? No. <laughs> My true passion would be her secret best friend that nobody knows about, <laughs> that she tells <laughs> everything. Um, a best friend is a job. <laughs> thank you you still have to work she said so that is working so I, cat sitter i'll be here cat sitter slash okay. best friend assistant no because her personal assistant has to talk to a lot of people that's very true i'll be the cat assistant yeah <laughs> i bet she does have <laughs> a cat, cat assistant <laughs> yes. she's gotta have a cat sitter yeah with how much she travels yeah what would you do i <laughs> would own a bookstore slash coffee shop that is open 24 7 Okay. I like that. That is my goal. I like that. So that way, A, for night shifters like me who want who don't have time to make it in the daytime. And also, like, say you're reading a book and the book, you finish it at like 2 a.m., but you got to have the next book in the series. Can you specialize in like... You can come right to my bookstore. Old, old timey books. I'll have all books. Like dark academia. Sure. I would love that. We'll have like a forbidden section like in Harry Potter. Like a haunted castle. The inside looks like an old haunted castle. We could have rooms that have different themes. Yeah. And one could be a haunted castle theme. I love themes. Haunted Hogwarts. Haunted Hogwarts theme with your candles that hang from the ceiling. I would love that (laughs) so much. And then we'll have um, a section that has old medical textbooks for Boydston. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) I could still be part of dark academia. And then we'll have a light and fluffy section as well for people who need some positivity in their lives. (laughs) <laughs> this is not the coffee shop for you. <laughs> You're gonna have to go down the street. We like everything dark and <laughs> mysterious. I don't know. Okay, so we'll do that um in our in our third lives. Our second life is doing the funeral home. What were you in a past life? I don't know what I was in a past life. What were you in a past life? Dead. Which <laughs> 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 Well, yes, which I should have Dead known witch. that. <laughs> of course. Burned at the stake. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> like, she talks so much. Why were Burn you her. dead? She died How in the past How would I have gotten life. here? I had to have died first. <laughs> She's a funny one. 
<laughs> a ghost in a past life because you died. Ooh, she would want hot people. I definitely would. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Honestly, just to like mess around people, but also just to be nosy. If you were a ghost, what would you say to people? Boo. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> classic. <laughs> a classic. <laughs> I just want you to know I love having visitors. <laughs> I have four brothers. <laughs> <laughs> this place to me is this. <laughs> my name is Sarah. <laughs> Ten minutes later, my my name is still Sarah. <laughs> How many of them are you are there? One. Just, it's just one. me. <laughs> it's just me, me and my personalities. <laughs> <laughs> love that for you. They'll still be scared. I'll knock. I'll be like a cat. I'll knock stuff off counters. Move stuff. Ooh, yeah. yes. You'll be a poltergeist. Yes. I would love to be a poltergeist. Oh my gosh, to mess with people. Yes. Okay. That's our third life. Fourth life. Fourth, yeah. Fourth life. All right. How many lives do we get? Nine? Nine, Unlimited. obviously. Unlimited, okay. <laughs> Unlimited, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, where well, there's a limit. Enough lives to learn all of the things your spirit needs to learn in order to ascend. Okay. That was very philosophical. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, my point to this is, I like books. Oh my god, I don't know if you knew that. Um, so I'm going to talk to you guys about a mysterious book. Ooh, <laughs> ooh, is this an old timey book? It is. I love ooh. this. Ooh, and I even have a PowerPoint for you guys. So this is the Voynich manuscript. I've heard of this. Have you? I have never heard of it until 3 a.m. this morning. <laughs> 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 All right, so the Voynich manuscript is an illustrated codex. And it is very, very, very rare because it's only one of its kind. What is a codex? A codex is like a book okay. with illustrations. <laughs> it's an illustrated It book. does have illustrations in it that we're going to get to. All right. So it is a handwritten, or it's handwritten in a language known as Voynichese. And I know you're going to ask what that is, and I will tell you. <laughs> what is that? From the land of Voynich? Good question. We'll come back to that. <laughs> Voyna? <laughs> Voin. Well, it is the Voynich manuscript, so Voynich. So it's 234 pages, but there is evidence that some pages are missing. We don't know how many. (laughs) The text is written from left to right, just how we use nowadays. Some pages fold, like fold out. Kind of like you think like kids books that have like, they fold out and they expand. Something like that. Ooh, origami pages. Yes. And then many of the pages have illustrations and diagrams. Some are colored, and they have people, plants, and astrological symbols, which we're going to get to also. It's because it's a codex. (laughs) Good job. In 1903, we're going to talk about the history first of it. So in 1903, the Jesuits were struggling with their financials in Rome. So they decided to sell some of their rare books that they had from the, it's the college in Rome. It's the Collegio Romano. But you couldn't have translated that to college Rome. Rome College. I got it. Rome College. So they sold, they had a collection of rare books there, and they sold them to the Vatican. So fast forward to 1912, and in comes a guy named Wilfred Voynich. Oh. Oh. He is a- Very philosophical. I don't like tiny glasses. (laughs) I don't trust anybody with tiny glasses. (laughs) (laughs) You must purse your lips when you have the teeny glasses. And he's got like the little- glasses. He's mm-hmm. got them attached to something, if you notice. It's giving Monopoly. <laughs> he is a book dealer from Poland, and he was passing through Italy and happened to hear about these rare books. So he approached the Jesuits, and he said, hey, can I look at your rare book collection? And he found this. as a pickup line. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I'll show you my rare book collection. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know how you would. <laughs> show me page 69. <laughs> <laughs> There it is. There it is. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so sorry. So he found this manuscript and it was untitled and he purchased it. And that's where things kind of get interesting because he's trying to discover where the origins of this book is. So when he opened the book, he knows that, that is a language that he does not know. Those are also pictures I don't know. Mm-hmm. Those Further. are women in green beans. <laughs> it's in a pool of green. It's boobies. a combination of... Like animal and women. Mm -hmm. So I picked this picture because it's like the closest (laughs) up of the words I could get. (laughs) Those boobs look like somebody's pinching (laughs) (laughs) it. So he notices, um, I don't know this language, but furthermore, nobody knows what this language is. So he thinks that this must be some kind of like old timey medieval black magic type of book. 
So he tries to sell it and is setting the price for $100,000, which is $3 million today. That's a lot of dollars. It's That's a lot a of fair dollars price that nobody things bought. that you don't know what it says. <laughs> yeah, nobody bought it. They were like, no thanks. Yeah. He died eventually in 1930, <laughs> and the book fell to his wife, Ethel, and she had a companion named Anne. I'll let you uh, imagine uh-huh. what that companion okay. meant. <laughs> Best friends. I'm happy for them. Best friends who lived together until they died. That's great. So, I mean, live your truth. <laughs> if you didn't have a family, you wouldn't live with us until you died. <laughs> Fair point. Rude. <laughs> Ethel placed the manuscript in a bank vault with a letter saying, do not open this until she died. And 30 years later, in 1960, she dies. So Anne gets the manuscript and she sells it two years later for $24,000, which is about $250,000 in today's day. And she sells it to H.P. Krauss. So Krauss gets this book. And he is also unable to read it or resell it. So instead, he just gifts it to Yale University's Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library in 1969. And it is still there today at Yale University. Um, In 2020, Yale did publish the manuscript online. So you can read it in their digital library. And it is locked away. So before 1912, they tried to trace where this book originally came from, and the earliest we can find it is the late 1500s. And this was owned by Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II. We don't know how he got it. We don't know where he bought it from, but he had it in his possession. And when he passed away, he passed it to his court chemist slash alchemist, Jakobos Horkikiki de Tepenek. Beautifully done. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. (laughs) <laughs> and we know this because we'll get to this later, but Jacobus's name is on the book. So when he died, he passed it to George Barish, which was a 17th century alchemist from Prague. And then he sent a letter to a man named Kircher. This letter was in 1639. So that is the first mention of the book. And he mentions the manuscript, asking him to help decode it, decipher it, whatever. Barish ended up passing away, and the manuscript was given to his friend, Jean-Marie Marcy, who then sent the manuscript to Kircher in 1665. And he was a Jesuit scholar, and they think that, that it just basically stayed at this college in Rome until Voynich found it 200 years later. So codebreakers from around the world have studied this, and they have tried to break the code, and they have not been successful. What we have found, though, is pretty interesting. So in 2009, the University of Arizona, they did some carbon dating and found that this book was written in the early 15th century from about 1404 to 1438. It's an old book. That's also kind of amazing that they can carbon date and estimate that. Stylistic analysts believe that it was composed in Italy during the Italian Renaissance. So the book is about nine by six inches and it's about two inches thick it holds 234 pages which is printed on vellum and this is how the carbon dating worked they looked at the vellum and it is prepared on animal skin or like a membrane they think it was like a calf skin and it was used as writing materials back then it is collected into 18 choirs which is a measure of paper quantity usually 18 choirs is about 25 sheets and it's across 102 folios which is like sections of books basically so as you can see there are illustrations and there is sometimes there are is like it almost looks like entire chapters that are just written around the pages and sometimes it's mainly illustrations with what looks like captions the top right hand corner of each page has been numbered from 1 to 116 using a style of numerals that were not originated until later but there are numbering gaps which is why they think there are missing pages Um, Some believe that the manuscript originally had about 20 more pages, but it's hard to tell. The binding has been altered. They did more protein testing in 2014 that revealed that the parchment was made from calf skin, like I said. So there are holes, there's tears in the parchment, which is why they think that this has been altered. They think it was made from about 14 to 15 calf skins. It's a lot. It's a lot of skin. (laughs) It's a lot of skin. It's a lot of calves (laughs) to make this book. It is also bound by goat skin, which is not original to the book. They think the Jesuits did this in some time in the 200 years they had it because they made a cover for it. So the ink does have color in it. Green. <laughs> it has green is very clear. Green, red, brown, white, 
and blue. And they did lots of testing on the paint. Basically, the colors are inexpensive. So that wasn't really a big clue on it. So the part that everybody is enthralled with is the text. So every page has some kind of written word on it in an unidentified language. Some pages, very few, have Latin, but the majority have never been able to be deciphered. The few words that are thought to be Latin, so there is a sequence of Latin letters in the right margin with the signature of Jacobi Timpanitz, who was one of the owners. Um, they think that he owned the book for a time and like just wrote his name on it. Like he didn't write this book. They think he just like wrote his name in it. <laughs> he was hence, here. Hence why we can read it. <laughs> we know Latin. <laughs> this book belongs to me. <laughs> this is my book. <laughs> There is a drawing of a nude man in one page with the words Der Mustel, which is German for a widow's share. Did you know that? No. <laughs> I did not know that either. It seems like a lot of English words for not a lot of German words. Yes. There is an astrological series of diagrams that has the names of 10 of the months from March to December written in Latin. This is another reason why they think pages are missing because January and February are gone. There are four lines in distorted Latin, and they say distorted because some of it can be translated, but it's like scrambled up words. It doesn't make sense when you translate it from Latin to English. So they don't know what that meant. Most pen strokes are one or two simple strokes. Just <laughs> gentle strokes. <laughs> don't laugh. <laughs> this book has a lot of strokes in it. It does have a lot strokes. of strokes in it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> some gentle strokes. Just, <laughs> Just a couple. <laughs> A script of about 20 to 25 characters, which we would call letters, would account for all of the text. So there are a dozen rare characters that occur only once or twice each, but there's no obvious punctuation, which makes this difficult to read. (laughs) Can you imagine? It's just one stream of consciousness. (laughs) Over 200 pages of no punctuation. (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) That's a good challenge. What is the longest sentence anybody can come up with? I don't know. I'll work on it. Okay. Okay. There are paragraphs, so they can tell where things are sectioned by that. So that's kind of how they've sectioned it. All right, so the way that they wrote, which is called the ductus, flows very smoothly. So what it means is it's fluid. It's not like you're writing a couple letters, then you're breaking and looking to see how to spell something. And you're writing a couple letters. So like it's all like one long stream of consciousness. Nailed so it. That's important because some people thought this was a code, like a spy was putting it in. And they're like, no. If you're like trying to write something purposefully in a different language or a code, you're going to be like checking it periodically and it's not going to flow very smoothly. So like I said, people have been trying to make an alphabet to help us understand this language. (laughs) Cryptographer William Friedman in the 1940s made an alphabet where each line of the manuscript was transcribed to a punch card to try to make this machine readable. Didn't produce any results. They have discovered, linguistics have studied and decided there are about 170,000 characters with spaces dividing the text into about 35,000 groups of length, a.k.a. words. So 35,000 different words that we don't know what they are. The structure of the word seems to follow the rule of linguistics. So certain characters appear in each word like vowels would. Some characters never follow others, like how W and Z would never be seen together in our language. And then some are doubled, like how we double some letters when we add suffixes and prefixes. And they have noticed that there are suffixes and prefixes in this language as well. All this to say, this is an actual language. This is not like something made up because it's too detailed. It's gibberish is what I've decided. <laughs> <laughs> um, Professor Gonzalo Rubio, an expert in ancient languages at Penn State University, said, quote, the things we know as grammatical markers, things that occur commonly at the beginning of or end of words such as S or D in our language, and that are used to express grammar, never appear in the middle of words in the Voynich manuscript. That's unheard of for any Indo-European, Hungarian, or Finnish language. Uh, One cryptographer in 1962 described analyzing this manuscript as, quote, doomed to utter frustration. Uh (laughs) I've been thinking that this whole time. I could (laughs) never handle this. People have literally been studying this for hundreds of years. Like, it's amazing. It has to just be, like, gibberish. So, in 2014, uh, Diego Amancio, he was from the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. He led a team, and they analyzed the relationship of the words in the text. 
he looked for connections and clusters of the words. So he was able to identify keywords and concluded that in 90% of the cases, the systems are similar to those in known books, indicating this is an actual language and not random gibberish. Lies. <laughs> it's gibberish. Several other linguistics have tested their theories and statistical methods as well and have reached the same conclusion. This is a natural language. If it was, then why can't they figure it out? (laughs) (laughs) That's great. It's because it's from another world. So since we cannot read this after we have tried and tried and tried, we have divided the book based off the illustrations. So it has been divided into six sections. The first section is herbal or botany. So. Venus flytraps. <laughs> <laughs> this is the biggest section. It's composed of 112 folios, which is the amount of pages that are in a book. And it has 113 highly detailed drawings of plants and herb species. Each page has about one to two plants and a few paragraphs of text. None of these plants have been identified in the real world. Mm-hmm. It mm-hmm. does not look like a sunflower. <laughs> they saying. think that this is a sunflower. <laughs> I think they're wrong. One of the things that they have found as to why they it is hard to identify these plants is because they said they use like different plant types. So like the uh, petals of one plant and the stem of another plant and the seeds of another plant. So it's like four plants composed into one. And that's why they can't identify any of them. It's because we've never seen it. Has anybody been outside of this world? The next section is the what? astronomy or the astrology section, which is composed of 21 folios. And these contain circular diagrams that suggest astronomy and astrology. So they're suns, moons, stars. Um, shoes. <laughs> there is one series that has the 12 signs that look like the symbols for the zodiac. So there's like a bull that they think means the Taurus and a fish for the Pisces. There are also 30 female figures who are partly nude holding a star. And the last two pages appear to be lost. Like I said, January and February are missing. And some of these diagrams are on fold out pages. But the depictions of the sun, the moon, and the stars do not appear to be related to any known constellations. Somebody worked really hard on this. <laughs> they really did. <laughs> I don't see any scratching out. The right? next That's section impressive. is the biology section. And How this is composed of 20 folios. If you um, wrote one word wrong, you had to start over. You had to start over. I mean, it's just like the days of the typewriter. There's no backspace. <laughs> biology. Okay. So this is biology. So this is pretty are. dense text that shows nude women in green baths. <laughs> With pointy boobs. <laughs> <laughs> Some are wearing a crown and they are mainly bathing. And these pools or tubs are connected by an elaborate network of pipes. I'm really glad you explained that as a crown. I thought they were gills. <laughs> or like, <laughs> they thought they were like their fish head. gills going down their back. They're crowns. They're very uh, okay. feminist. Nude women with crowns. They're, they're holding hands. Yeah. They're enjoying their bath together. I don't know why the water's green, but they're enjoying their bath. Spinach. <laughs> it's nutrients. Um, so these networks of pipes is interesting because it forms an integrated design with water flowing from like one folio or one page to the other. Hmm. Um, the next section is the cosmology section. And this has circular diagrams that are obscure. So this is an example of like a fold out. So it's one page that folded out. That's fun. Somebody was creative. And it has maps and diagrams with nine islands that they call connected by causeways. And there's castles and even a volcano pictured in one. Look at how detailed that is. That is insane. This is definitely not on planet Earth. I'm just saying this part for sure. The next section is the pharmaceutical section. Ooh, I like that section. So like the botany, it has a lot of plants, but it also has um, isolated plant parts like roots and leaves and then things that look like apothecary jars. Um, None of these plants have been identified, but it has about 100 drawings. And this is 34 folios. It just hit me. This is clearly somebody's retelling of their alien abduction. Okay, yeah, and all the things they saw. Yeah, and they lived on the planet for some time, and this is what they saw. Yeah, they they summered on Planet X. And this Planet is the X. language that they learned, and they wrote it all in this language to preserve it. And the plants that they saw? Yes. And the women in spinach. And the women in spinach, <laughs> and they would be young for eternity because they bathe in spinach every day. Ooh. Look at all this greenery. I know. Look at how detailed it all is. All right, the last section is recipes. 
And this is full pages of text that are broken into very short paragraphs, each marked with a star in the left margin. Yeah, these are like doodles. So they think that these are recipes that involve the plants that were seen earlier. Mm, okay. They're telling you what to do with the plants. Clever. Because this is the only section that does not have any drawings except for those stars on the left-hand side. In this section, five folios contain only text, and at least 14, they think, are missing from the manuscript. So the overall purpose here, many believe that this was meant to serve as a, like, modern medicine book back then. So they're thinking these plants and the apothecary jars and the recipes, it was all some kind of medical book. And also back then, astrology was pretty big and played a prominent role in gathering herbs. Um, It played a prominent role with bloodletting and other early medical procedures. So they think that's why that was included. So the first possible author is Roger Bacon. He was a 13th century philosopher and alchemist, and he was thought to be the author because when Voynich first got the manuscript, there was a letter tucked inside the book that theorized Bacon was the author. So he's like, okay, it's Bacon. Bacon was pretty famous, so it would have benefited Voynich if Bacon was the author because he probably could have sold it from that much money. Based off of the theory of Bacon writing the manuscript, people have said that he would have had to use a telescope and a microscope in order to come up with these drawings, and those were not invented for centuries later. Carbon dating also, like I said, we did that in the early 2000s, and that showed that the parchment that was used did not come around also until centuries after Bacon Although, to Voynich's credit, he could not have done that at the time. Some believe that Voynich made this manuscript and it was all a hoax. They think that it's gibberish. he was trying to rake in the money, right? And that he just made this all up with gibberish. But again, with all the testing that we have done with carbon dating, this seems impossible because he didn't find the text until the early 1900s and this book came about in the 1500s. A Turkish electrical engineer Ahmad Arnaj in 2018 claims that he and his sons have translated 30% of the manuscript and they say it is old Turkish. Problem here, (laughs) nobody can verify if he's actually deciphered it because there's no way to test it. Nobody knows what this says. So it's not like, oh yeah, sure, we agree with you. (laughs) One of the leading experts on the manuscript, Lisa Foggin Davis, She is usually quick to discredit all the theories, but she says the theory of it being old Turkish is, quote, one of the few solutions I've seen that is consistent, repeatable, and results in sensical text. And then the most common theory is that it is a medical book that is written in a lost language. Okay. Like I said, over the years, people have tried from all around the world. They have spent their lives devoting to try to break this manuscript and come up with what it means, and they have all failed. No matter what country they come from, nobody can seem to figure out what this means. It has been pretty much decided across the academic circles that this is not a made-up language, that it is some kind of language, but must just be a lost language. Some people in 2014, they said that they were able to identify 37 of the plants, and they think that they were Aztec, dating back to the 1520s to the 1570s, and they theorize this is one of the languages of the Aztecs that is now a dead language. Nobody knows. I mean, maybe they're just poorly drawn images, and we just really can't tell. <laughs> they could be. Like, we've never seen them, but I still think it might be a. That is one of the other encounter. theories: is people think that this is a book that aliens or somebody wrote, and that's why we don't know any of these plants or any of this language. That makes the most sense. So who knows? We may never know, but that is the story of the Voynich manuscript. I've never heard of that. Thank you for sharing. I had, and I love it. Thank you. You're welcome. I thought it was fascinating. The more I read about it, I was like, this is insane that people have literally spent their lives devoting to this and they still don't know what it means. Well, it's hard to comprehend something existing that we know absolutely nothing about. Mm -hmm. Like there's so much history and we've been able to decipher things and figure things out and just to know nothing. To know nothing about it. And then for like the plants to not be anything that we have or see, um, the woman swimming in spinach (laughs) is not of this world either. <laughs> Did you know about that part? No. That was new. That was new. Maybe maybe it's a sign that that's what we should be doing. <laughs> Swimming in spinach? Yeah. That is the fountain of youth. So yes, I um, googled at work last night f- weird but creepy stories or mysteries and that came up and I was like, this is fascinating. I must talk about a book that nobody knows what it means. I it love old books. Fits you perfectly. Thank you. <laughs> Weird old books. 
that came from outer space. That's Lindsay. <laughs> That's an alien abduction tale. The more I researched it, I was like, they're going to think this is an alien book. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> I went into it thinking it was an alien book. So I didn't know anything. And I still think it's an alien book. We so. could go to Yale and go look at the book. I can present my theory. <laughs> Excuse me, but have you discussed aliens as a theory? My theory is two sentences. <laughs> Please consider. <laughs> Professor Scholar, do you wish to consider this being from outer space? <laughs> I have spent hundreds of seconds considering what this might be. Hundreds of seconds. <laughs> and so how, here we are. How do they get to Earth? Well, that's what I'm saying. The person was abducted. Okay. And they spent time on this planet. And they wrote it all out. Yes. Or came back and wrote it out. And then they bound it and they gave it to this random emperor in the 1500s and said, have fun. Yeah. Somebody needs to know about my alien abduction (laughs) and the things that might happen in the future. With these plants and these women in the pool. Look how pointy it made their (laughs) boobs. (laughs) Women everywhere will want this. (laughs) So that is my smorgasbord episode for you guys. (laughs) Thank you for sharing. Love it. Thank you. You are welcome. All right, guys. Thanks so much for tuning in to this week's episode. You can always find us at thetipsyghost.com with our socials linked from there or send us an email at thetipsyghost at gmail.com. Please give us a five-star rating and a great review anywhere you listen to podcasts. We really appreciate it and it really does help. All right, guys. Thanks so much. We'll catch you next week. Okay, bye. Bye. bye.